This podcast is supported by Camp Coffee Company in Oceanside, California. Camp Coffee is a true locals cafe that happens to serve excellent coffee and food. Check out the at We Are Camp Coffee Instagram feed and you'll see more than lattes perfectly quaffed with foam. You'll see the community of Oceanside. You'll see lives being lived. You'll see Oside expanding and contracting with the seasons. And you'll see the smiles on the faces of people who found their happy place nestled into the corner of downtown at Camp Coffee. On CampCoffee.com, you can order food or coffee for pickup from the cafe, see the newest camp swag, I happen to have the t-shirt and a coffee mug, and even order whole coffee beans, so you're never short on the days you can't get to camp. On the patio at Camp Coffee, lives are intertwined and neighbors become friends over coffee and tea, and probably with a pastry or one of their iconic grilled cheese sandwiches. Head to campcoffeecompany.com to learn more or visit your new coffee family at Camp Coffee Company in downtown Oceanside. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Coffee People podcast, which is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network and presented by Roastar Coffee Packaging. If you are a small business roasting excellent coffee that you want to showcase in some sturdy, well-crafted, recyclable cans, perhaps one already decorated for the holidays, you'll find what you're looking for at Roastar.com. That's Roastar.com. I'm Ryan Wolt, and this is the Coffee Podcast where we meet interesting people connected to the world of coffee. Let me start by apologizing for my voice and possibly scattered thoughts. I went to four coffee shops the other day dropping off holiday guess the bean contest kits, more on that later, and unfortunately came home with a nasty head cold. It's going around. Stay healthy out there. I'm not a doctor, but I think washing your hands, masking when appropriate, and drinking copious amounts of coffee probably help. Again, not a doctor. Today we're chatting with Bryant Banker Scannell. He's a dual threat in the coffee industry as a coffee educator with Mill City Roasters, and also the founder and head roaster at Relative Coffee Company, both based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and both of which you'll find the links to in this podcast's show notes or in this week's newsletter at coffeepeoplepodcast.com. Bryant is also a dual threat as a human being, because in my short time with him, I got a sense that he was both a wealth of coffee information and a genuinely pleasant person. We're going to learn more about his coffee journey, in particular, how a visit to a dying mall to get a cup of coffee helped set him on the path he's on now, and we delve into the idea that journeys we've taken to this place, this moment in time, it's often circuitous. I took a circular trip to get my cup of coffee this morning. Namely, I circled around the dog, who was still asleep, to get to my coffee shelf, where I could get my V60 and some coffee beans. I hope you took a more direct route. You should have some good coffee in your taza, which is Italian for cup, because it is time for this Coffee People podcast conversation with Bryant Banker Scannell, coffee educator at Mill City Roasters and founder of Relative Coffee Company. No, just happy to happy to be here, hanging out, drinking coffee with you. Made my uh, make my co- made my coffee really quick just before we hopped on here. It was one of those uh, I've been using the Aromatic app, and just hit and surprised me for a random AeroPress recipe. Oh, that's fun! Thirty grams in, forty second brew for this wow. recipe, and uh, tastes tastes nice. Cool. I've been doing a lot of French press this week. I make a big pot of French press in the morning. The coffee that I'm drinking is from a a place here called Zumbar Coffee and Tea. And when I first went there 11 years ago, they served me my first coffee in a French press. And I I just kind of fell in love with it. And so now I brew a a big pot, a big 32-ounce pot of it in the morning. And then if I need a backup, I have my little mini press. Yeah, uh, in the afternoon <laughs> or early afternoon. Classic. It's like that 
that first introductory cup where it's like, I will never forget like that French press was incredible. Yeah. And I still, I still think the coffee that they make lends itself to a good French press, you know, I, nice. not that it's not good other ways, but I feel like it tastes better that way. And I've also been drinking a lot of decaf lately and I find the same thing. Most decafs tend to lend themselves better to a French press than maybe something where I'm going to get too serious about what I'm tasting. Right. Uh, that could be yeah. just me, but maybe it's a solubility thing or yeah, who knows? Could be user error too. I mean, I don't <laughs> We never consider user error. We just go like this is what it is. Well, now that we've been talking for about four minutes, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, let us know who you are, where where you are in the world of coffee, and uh, where you are literally, physically, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my name is Bryant Banker hyphen Scannell. My wife and I talk about why did we hyphen our names? We should just go back to our, you know, just <laughs> last names because it's, it's a headache sometimes. I am in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I work for a roaster manufacturer called Mill City Roasters. And I'm also the founder of just an e-commerce small batch coffee company called Relative Coffee Co. And not to jump too into the weeds right away, but no conflict of interest having your own coffee company and then also Mill City. Right. Yeah. It's actually kind of like a mutual partnership, understanding one of those where the act of like a coffee company, you know, I don't want it to like interfere with like my work at Mill City, but it is also kind of like to the benefit um, as well to be able to kind of like roast and kind of share what I'm doing. I think as an educator too, because we spend so much time telling folks like, hey, maybe you should try this with this roasted coffee next time, or, or this would maybe taste better. But if they can't like buy coffee, from the person telling them to do it, then kind of gets a little murky, kind of like uh, rolling Reddit and being like, I need roasting <laughs> help, but they're not selling coffee, but they're giving all the advice. <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to get into your role as an education uh, or a coffee educator with Mill City. But before we do, I want to learn just a little bit more about you and your, and your coffee journey background. It was a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, we're, let's start at the beginning. What was the very first cup that you ever had that you remember? Oh, my gosh, that <laughs> that I remember was and I, I feel like this is true for a lot of folks that ended up going the specialty coffee route is that it was a natural processed Ethiopia, Mora Mora, I remember was, you know, either the tagline for maybe the watching station or um, the estate, whatever whatever it be, it was 2010. And it was actually when I first got introduced to Dogwood Coffee. It was also the year that they incorporated and took over a spot in this mall in South Minneapolis that used to be a Starbucks coffee. And so my wife and I were just out. I remember it was maybe fall, winter. It was cold. <laughs> and could have been July for all we know. Right, exactly. Yeah, who's 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 keeping who's keeping track? Weather is uh, not accurate to seasons these days. I remember, we entered in. All the mall shops were closed because it was kind of like a dying mall structure in South Minneapolis. So there were usually only the only thing open after hours, and then maybe a few restaurants. But you know, just one barista like working in the back, and I had no knowledge about specialty coffee but they were very nice and i just remember it was like an incredible cup that got me coming back mm. that's kind of where it all started i was just thinking as you were saying that i've shared my story on the show about my first cup in star lounge in chicago my first craft cup but and this maybe you have this as well you remember that coffee that you have but you also remember the experience of going to the mall with your wife and, you know, this dying mall thing, which is, you know, <laughs> nationwide, we all know that, uh, that yeah. what that looks like. I wasn't a coffee drinker, but I remember going to a coffee shop and the experience of sitting with other people who are drinking coffee and just talking and 
late into the night when I was young and everything mattered so much more than it seems to. <laughs> right. Now. Yeah. The, be- the best times, <laughs> you know, and that I think for me, that experience of what the community of coffee was, was first before the actual coffee. And I'm just realizing that as I'm talking to you. Yeah. And I've only been doing this show for three years. So. Right. Well, that's, and that's huge. Cause it's like, community is such like a core part of like the coffee industry but it's also kind of funny because i feel like in the coffee industry it attracts all of these like creative like-minded individuals and you know whether it's you know you're a creative by like trade where coffee allows you to do Mm -hmm. your artistic practice after hours but you also have folks that are you know, in software development or aviation, and they find themselves now in, in my experience for, you know, roasting behind the scenes, like they've always had a passion for coffee and they wanted to get out of that like day-to-day rigmarole and coffee was like a nice Zen practice that they really wanted to like focus in on. Kind of neat. The coffee shop that I really cut my teeth on the learning side of things is in San Diego. And we have a very large science and tech hub. A lot of those employees happen to come to this shop. And we sort of opened up the shop after hours. The the shop is closed, but you can come here and do coffee experiments. You know, you can come brew a cup and bring your refractometers and bring your beakers and your whatever. But these are like world-class scientists working on like RNA vaccines and like all kinds of crazy stuff. Except what they wanted to do with their free time was test, you know, the solubles in their cup of coffee or whatever it was. And so there was all this high level thinking going on. And I was going, I don't taste blueberries in this cup. I just taste dirt. Like, you know, how can I get to where you are? It it is great how it it appeals to people across all swaths of, of education and intelligence and desire and passion. And they can all find their little thing in coffee. Before you you ended up where you are now as a roaster of your own coffee and working coffee education, you started as a barista, if I'm not mistaken, and you've been in the industry for a while. <laughs> a, while. a handsome minute. But I mean, there's, you know, compared to like other folks time, like, well, like, like, I guess I'll never catch up, but I'm always constantly getting further along in my time in the industry. What is it about the industry that appealed to you to get that first job? I mean, having a cup of coffee you like is not the same as going, you know, oh, I, I had this coffee and now I'm going to start working as a barista. <laughs> it's kind of a big jump. Yeah, it it's kind of a weird jump, you know. I I remember applying for Caribou Coffee, and it came, um, it came after like a a big car accident that I had, where like I couldn't work like in a physical job anymore, I'd be on my feet for a long time, which is kind of funny because now I'm on my feet <laughs> doing physical things all day long. But at the time, it was a car rollover accident, so everything was just kind of like bride at the moment and i was like well i can't lift up these spools of like shipboard wire and cable for this shipping gig that i had and um thanks to grandpa for for that job when he had that company but after that i was like well coffee seems nice and i just kind of was like well i i need a job and i'm always going to caribou these days so maybe i'll apply and as one does when they're maybe what 20 21 i don't know how old i was at the time but i remember one of my like things i said was i just want to make people's morning and you know whether that was like a spiel at the time for like please give me this job i need to make money like next week (laughs) um or if it was actually like you know a true thing i think it it became true. I think I found out that it was actually more of a truth than not. Cause I think it was fun to just kind of have that like relation with people that always came in, you know, their order, you know, kind of like what's going on with their days in and outs. And it kind of keeps them around to like want to chat and like establish this like bond in a way that aspect just kind of like, you know, was very enticing to me. And I've worked in, 
the service industry for a long time, you know, since I was 14 at the, the BK Lounge, Burger King, you know, many jobs and iterations afterwards, you know, ending up in coffee. And when specialty coffee started making its way like into like my peripheral after that cup, I was like, I am going to work for this company or I am going like Dogwood when I first had that coffee. I was like, that's like my, my goal. That's what I see on the horizon. <laughs> it was at a time where, you know, a lot of specialty shops that were around were like kind of highly coveted. Like we have Copland's, which was like a big national thing, like back in like 2011. Spy House had just started getting in the game from being, you know, a little bit smaller to getting a little bit bigger in specialty coffee. Dogwood Incorporated, we had some like small in the wall shops um, that were doing cool things, but getting hired was hard because you had to have experience on like a manual espresso machine. And I just had a nice semi-automatic set, Caribou or um, mm -hmm. Starbucks at a Target when I was there. So I was like, well, how do I get experience? The airport opened up a specialty shop and nobody wanted to work in the airport. So getting that job was very easy <laughs> where I was at Caribou. And then I moved to the airport to a shop called World Bean. And it was one of those organizations that are doing local concepts in a concourse of the airport. And their model was, you know, a local coffee company will be like one espresso and maybe the pour overs. Then we use Cafe Vita uh, from Seattle for everything else. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, it gave me access to a Seneso, which was my very first little little baby that I got to learn on. Seneso three group head machine and manual grinders. And I was like, how do you operate any of this? They just <laughs> set me on the bar. It was like an airport rush. And they're like, this is your machine now. I'm like, is it? I don't, how do you grind? Is it this button? Like, how do you steam milk? And I spent maybe the first month of my job there with my phone up on the group head where the counter counts up for your mm -hmm. shot to be pulled just with YouTube videos of like how they're steaming milk, how they're pulling shots on repeat <laughs> while I was working and serving. So it was kind of like doing the thing, even though it was kind of okay, but to get better at it over time. Sure. So very fortunate for that job. That gives me these horrible flashbacks of I was a bartender on the Sunday brunch shift at a place in Madison, Wisconsin, <laughs> and we had an espresso machine and we advertised as having cappuccino and lattes. And I was making all of those drinks, but my training was probably less than what you got at the airport. <laughs> uh, I My job oh, was no. to make. I was a guy who made drinks, not someone who understood how to make coffee or anything. And at the time, it didn't matter to me. But now I look back and I think, God, I hope I didn't ruin coffee for someone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they just like went somewhere else if that was the case, maybe. <laughs> I hope I hope my drinks were stiff enough that they don't remember what I did in the coffee. There we, there we go. That's a good way. That's a good <laughs> That's funny because, you know, I hope my drink was stiff enough, like to make them forget that the airport job I had also served cocktails. Oh, sure. <laughs> I had never drank in a cocktail or made a cocktail in my life. So when somebody ordered a white Russian, I was like, I hope this is what you want. So who knows? What does life? Yeah. You know what? They probably got on the plane. Yeah. I, th I don't want to say that expectations are lower at the airport, but my expectations are a little bit lower when I get something somewhere. So I try to stick with things that like are pre-packaged, yeah. if that makes sense. But That does make a lot of sense. Uh, that's just me. You eventually do end up working for Dogwood. You achieved your goal <laughs> early in life, I might add. So you have you know, the whole rest of your life to find a new goal. Right. How did you end up getting that job at Dog at Dogwood? And you know, what did what was the next step in your progression as a coffee professional? Well, remember how I said nobody wants to work in the airport, especially us coffee folks. It's a lot of work to get in and out and very early. I was looking for a job 
outside of the airport, maybe after like six months, eight months of the 3 a.m. commute just to like get in past security. And a restaurant in town called Victory 44, no longer a restaurant, but they were good while it lasted. It was during the gastro pub boom where everybody was bringing gastronomy into their restaurants and it was kind of a destination spot that folks would flock to so you know foams and cheese whiz and like all these weird things that i had no idea what they were but i was going there just in my free time when you know i was going to community college maybe needing to like study a little bit and i'd just like go there for a cup because i knew they had specialty coffee Rista lead there at the time, I just would always pick his brain about stuff and got very close. And he was like, well, if you ever want a coffee job or you want to apply here, you know, I'd happily take your resume. And so I did. I was like, okay, please take my resume and see if I get a job. They sat me down with the head chef at the time, who was like, well, you need to know how to pair food with coffee and serve coffee out to people. And pour lattes at the table, not pour them at the bar and then bring them out. So we actually had to steam the milk, pull the shot, bring it out, and then pour everything for them and serve them at the table. Wow, that's a real timing nightmare. Yes. So a lot of moving pieces and I learned very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of got me out of the airport and, you know, the restaurant life just isn't isn't for me, which is funny because my journey continues in the restaurant industry after this even. You know, I was working here and, you know, they put me on a few dinner shifts and I remember it being a nightmare because there's some, you know, New York chef mentality there where, you know, you drop a spoon or if you have like the cheat sheet behind your thing, you know, you get like, that's, that's a no, no. But I was going to go back to the airport. because I was like, this isn't for me. So when I decided that, they were like, well, tell us what it would take to make you stay. Give it the weekend. Hmm. Give it a think. And I was like, okay. Like, I will think about it. Now, I should say they were also serving dogwood at the time. So it was adjacent to kind of what I was trying to get to. And they had become partners with dogwood in a cafe restaurant concept that was a little bit more relaxed than where I was at. So when I came back after the weekend, they didn't even listen to what I had thought about. They just told me, we have a solution for you. You're going to go down to this restaurant called Parka, which is also no longer a restaurant anymore, by the way. And you're going to help these guys out, get customer retention, have more folks coming in the door and just build relationships. I'm like, okay, that's great. And we'll pay you more. I was like, even better. Ship me down there. So I moved on down there as a barista and they didn't know why I was there. And one of my good friends now is just like, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? And he always <laughs> jokes about it. Like I was this person that was going to come in and whip them into shape. But then he got to know me and was like, He's not, he was nothing like that. But I was like, this is my goal. This is what they told me I need to do. I have to help you gain customers somehow. And they were like, we don't know what you mean. We don't know why you're here. I'm like, well, I guess I will just work as your barista then. Months go by and a new location opens up at the... MIA, uh, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, big art gallery. They opened up a cafe concept there. So my manager at the time moved over there and he asks, do you want to take over running this cafe restaurant as manager? And I was like, sure. Yeah, it's like another step up and it'll be great. This is still when everybody's a partnership. So the restaurant, Dogwood, all this stuff is going on still. Well, get another half year to a year through, and that partnership splits. The restaurant that sent me down to Parka, which was like a Dogwood brand, split off of the partnership, but then I stayed on the Dogwood side. So I kind of, in a way, got like trapped, like right place, right time from like sure. the breakup. And then I was manager for a while until they shut down the restaurant and made it a full-fledged cafe. And for a good year or two, just ran that as manager. Mr. Manager, owed to uh, Arrested Development. Then our roaster at the time had a degree where in like maps or working in the DNR and he wanted to kind of go back into his field. And so they needed a new production roaster. And so I interviewed and while I was managing, I pretty much did two jobs 
in one day. I would go to the roastery during the day and do like a boot camp learning session and show like, I have interest, please pick me for the job. And they were interviewing a couple people at the time for it. And then at night I would go and I would close the shop so that I could kind of do both of them and just try and get the roasting gig. And that worked. I eventually just kind of got brought in to roasting because I had just like shown that I wanted to be there and uh, had a one month boot camp of how to roast coffee. And wow. then, yeah. So then from, from that one month boot camp, it was like, here's all the profiles that I've done for this entire, you know, life of the company for the last two, three years, they are yours now. And so I followed them for a year and it was only after a year that I was like, okay, I've had all of these new harvests come in. I'm seeing coffees that I recognize. I feel comfortable to start making changes to these coffees and roasting changes. And it was a lot of trial by fire. First Light Coffee Whiskey is for those seeking adventure. They exist to provide the perfect spirit for celebrating life's best moments when and wherever they occur. Winners of half a dozen SIP awards, First Light's whiskey blends real coffee extract with American whiskey and organic agave. Head to firstlightwhiskey.com to find their original and dark roast whiskeys at your favorite beverage shops and cocktail purveyors. Shop now on firstlightwhiskey.com. What's interesting to me is you moved into a production roaster role and part of the reason you got the job was because of your passion and interest for it. I think there is a outside view of, of coffee roasting as being romantic and fun and elegant, but yeah. production roasting can beat you down pretty quickly too. It's very repetitive yeah. and there's a lot of learning and like I did everything right and it still didn't work <laughs> sometimes when you're starting. Yeah. So that you made it a year and you started making changes what did it feel like to make that your own? Right. It's, it was kind of a point where I remember this to be, you know, deep sweet, but like maybe missing something like acidic. I wonder if I shorten the roast by 15 seconds to the same temperature, if that would do something. And then cupping like every day, we cupped four days a week to like see changes that happen like every day. And Every batch, I would almost also split it up to where if I had full batches to do of something, which at the time was a 25 kilo pro bat, we shared a birth year, 1990, just to date myself there. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was a rigged up machine where, you know, there wasn't any variable special control. It was just like all gas or less gas or no gas. <laughs> and, you know, it was just a lot of that being forced into driving with only the gas pedal that I think made it a little easier, but it's also scary because when things don't work out, you're like, why didn't it work out? And then you don't really have like a lead roaster helping to tell you. So it was really a lot of, yeah, the craft of like, uh, the scientific method, I suppose I did this. How did it change it? Did I like it or not? Let's revisit and see what we can change next time. Where do you start transitioning to roasting into the role you're in now, which I find incredibly fascinating, which is coffee education? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, you know, from so 2013 to 2020, I was at, at Dogwood and I was, I was the only roaster during that time. And when COVID hit, that just threw a, a wrench in everything. So 2020 was kind of the year of reckoning, of course. I mean, we've, we've heard this for a lot of folks, a lot of industries. So without diving into that, I was kind of flying a little blind. I was, I was let go in, in mid 2020 and Steve at Mill City had, had learned that. And I was on a, this is also a very distinct memory. My wife and I decided to live out of a van uh, for a couple months, built up the Dodge Grand Caravan, drove out west, and we were on the, the Orca Islands off of uh, the coast of Washington, and we were doing laundry, and Steve called me from Mill City, 
was like, hey, I think I have a gig that you might be interested in. You know, when you're settled back in Minneapolis, you know, give me a ring, come on in for an interview and, and we'll chat. Was the van trip like it, the plan to just stay on the van trip? Was it like a new living kind of moving into van life situation? Or were you just like, you know what, we've got a minute, let's take a vacation? It was kind of a minute. And I think it was also kind of a time of where, you know, mm-hmm. nobody saw things coming like in, in 2020. So it was a little bit of that like shock to the system. Mm-hmm. So almost taking a step back and being like, am I going to stay in coffee? Do I continue in coffee? Do I look at other career outlets? And I'm happy I didn't because I was looking towards like development and UI UX. And now that I see and have been close to people that work those kinds of jobs, I'm like, God, I would have, I wouldn't have been able to last long. <laughs> I need to be moving. <laughs> you know, that was just kind of, you know, a couple months. And then we had to be back to, you know, vote. For the election you know that was important to us so it was like van life and so we had to vote and then we're back home during that time you know we got back in november i had interviewed with mill city and there was this brief period of time though where i had reached out and didn't hear anything back and i was really worried i was like oh did i miss like an opportunity like what happened i was like oh gosh what am i gonna do little did i know there's like two or three phones that you know, they operate off of. So I just like had a voicemail. They hadn't heard it for a while. And uh, they called me in. And by early December of 2020, I was uh, working for them, but not with an actual position yet. It was kind of just like, come on in, you know, we'll give you a landing spot and see what you can do. So I did. I sat at a desk. I got really good at spreadsheets and very, very in-depth spreadsheets. And over time, maybe like half a year or so, there is a opportunity for me to step into kind of the education role to kind of assist and help out with uh, virtual education because we were still doing remote classes due to COVID. And so remote roasting and just kind of like controlling roasters and helping at the end of the day and talking about what changes made what. And then also roasting in house. So roasting for customers like a wholesale roastery which I believe at this point, Mill City is the only manufacturer of roasters that roasts coffee in-house, which is mm-hmm. kind of cool. And, and it was a program where they asked if I wanted to like keep it going and keep it alive. And I was like, yeah. I was like, because that's what I did for a very long time. And it would also get me back on the roasters. So that kind of moved me away from that desk desk position, which was really nice. So what is it that you do then, or what is, is the role of your, of the education team at Mill City? You know, who is it that you're educating? What are they getting out of the deal? Yeah. I mean, you know, the education is really geared towards roast theory and controlling the roaster, like machine control overall. And then the flip side of that is what are we tasting after that machine control? You know, we can kind of talk theory and talk about curves and like how things look all day long. But if if we can't taste it and we can't really compare things side by side to figure out what threaded the needle, then we don't really have much to go off of. So a lot of times we have students that are thinking about roasting and if it's something that they want to get into and really like invest a lot of money in. So they can get in front of a roaster, get hands on time, kind of act like a production roaster with like some exercises. We have some folks that are on smaller machines, like maybe they're coming from a little Elio Bullet, like a one kilo roaster, electric. Maybe they're coming from a small little like Pookie or um, Be More kind of like convection oven roaster. And, you know, all walks and if they want to step up to production. Then we also have folks that are already on 12 kilo pro bats, maybe like a 15 kilo San Fran, and they're either shopping around for their next machine. They're looking to just brush up on new knowledge and just get some more understanding. And so we're kind of a hub for all of that, just to kind of help guide people down their journey of roasting in a very kind of like nonchalant, approachable way. (laughs) We mentioned at the top that you have your own coffee roasting 
small batch coffee operation called Relative uh, Coffee Company. How did that start and kind of what's your what's your ethos behind that? Like, what does it mean to you? What is how does it reflect your you as a coffee person? For me, like art has always been a thing like before coffee. Yeah, you went to art school at one point, didn't you? I did. And I didn't complete any of it only because of money, (laughs) but not that I didn't want to stay. But I went to school for photography, which is, you know, just about as like basic as it can be. So I merged it into visual communications. So graphic design, uh, screen printing, relief printing, all that stuff. Illustration and graphics have always kind of been something that I've really loved to do. And so with coffee, it kind of merges like the best of the two things. I get to be creative, but I also get to flex what I understand about coffee roasting. And relative is really that idea of, you know, comparison. It, I guess it works twofold as in like your cousin or your aunt or, you know, your, your mom, but it's really meant to kind of challenge that idea of, you know, tasting things in comparison. And I, I had this idea for a while where if I ever have like the same coffee as somebody else, like just being able to promote that coffee alongside and being like, buy both, taste both. Cause every roaster does something a little bit different and roast levels. And I'm going to say it is relative because there's such a spectrum of how you can do a light roast, a medium, a dark. And I think we're starting to get a little bit better on like how to communicate that more. I think we're seeing things from like the beer industry for, you know, sour beers is like, is it more acidic or is it more sweet? Is it more art? Is it more, I don't things like that sliding scales. There's actually a, a brewery who I'm I don't want to uplift, so I'm not going to say their name. But they had this really cool yeah. concept a while back, where they released the same beer, same ingredients, same process of brewing, yeah. but in seven different versions, and they just changed one the hop ingredient. So you cool. could taste their identical beer, identical ratio, identical recipe, except for this one change, and you could taste them all next to each other. Yeah. I love that concept and uh, something you're saying that I don't know that we've really talked about on the show before or with anyone, but is roasters from around the country and the world are going to be buying coffees sometimes from the same place. You know, it's not like, you know, if you buy it at coffee shop, a, you're not going to find it somewhere else, but how that coffee was treated will be different you know, from place to place. And so that's a really unique thing. If you could create a network where people could say, Hey, we all bought from the same batch. That'd be pretty cool. Maybe that's, that's the next step. It's, it's definitely one of those, you know, pet projects where, you know, if I can just move it off the ground more and more, I think that will open up more avenues to do fun Mm -hmm. projects like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think the sky's the limit with it as long as there's, there's time. And, you know, it's something that I'm kind of exploring and also I have a really bad habit of like needing to do the thing that like other people do or, (laughs) you know, it's like, oh, like you're selling coffee, but to help me understand it better, I need to also be doing it so that I can help somebody do it better as well. So in a way, it also assists me in like the roasting education just to kind of like have a point of reference and comparison for folks. Well, I would think there would be a risk too of getting too far away from the hands-on that you become a teacher in theory only. Right. Because things are constantly changing and and evolving in technology and equipment and the beans that you're receiving. The relative coffee, I think, probably scratches another itch for you in the design. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the color block packaging and how you came up with that concept and just the design of it overall. Because for me... Uh, I have a design degree, but doing any sort of design for myself devolves into me going, okay, I, I need to just pick something because I'll sit here for a thousand years. Well, that, that did happen to me quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I, I wrote up when I hit publish for, or when I hit make public on the website, I suppose I kicked it off with like a first blog just to, you know, also have content on there. Nobody likes going someplace and it's like, oh, all of these click through links have nothing on them. The first blog was kind of designing relative and looking through the process of like all these different designs. And there were more beyond what I shared in there. But, 
you know, I knew, I knew for me, there was a lot of aspect about color, regardless of my wardrobe choice. Color is like something I'm very like into or like color block hats in a way, I suppose. So I knew I wanted to bring color into, into the design, but then I started getting heady about it where I was thinking, oh, the various regions where coffee is grown, five major regions, you know, like Central America, South America, Africa, Indo-Pacific, Asia. So I was like, oh, five colors that can kind of come together that way. I started playing around with that. And then the colors devolved into like what color I feel like each region represents. Then that also sent me into a spiral because I was like, well, that's just kind of like putting a blanket <laughs> statement on, a, on an entire continent or entire region. So that kind of also devolved a little bit. So I dissected a lot of my design into like random offshoots that looked like 10 different companies. And, and I remember I had a friend that was, you know, into design, into marketing, did a lot of video marketing, worked on some like, okay, go music videos um, that were like really cool. And I was like, hey, would you be interested in just like looking at my stuff and I'll send you a bag like when it goes public? So we met up via Zoom quick and he had put together a quick slideshow of like, what were you thinking? Here's what's working. Here's my <laughs> ideas of what you should do. May God be with you, you know, stuff like that. It was kind of that, that meeting that kind of pulled me out of like all of these designs, all of these decisions of being like, oh, okay, here are the strong elements of this design process. And this is what I should go with and just kind of stop nitpicking as much as I was. Because, <laughs> you know, brands evolve and brands change. And, you know, how many times have we seen, like, a favorite company change their logo? But I think the core aspect of, like, colorful and fun will always be be part of it. What's nice is when you're small or when you're new is nobody knows or cares about you. Uh, it's only after <laughs> you've you've done something successful that you decide to tinker that you can cause real damage. Exactly. <laughs> I just watched this little mini doc about Tropicana, uh, who changed oh. their classic, you know, orange with the straw in it logo uh, yeah. for a brief time. And over like the three month period after their new packages came out, they lost about $60 million in sales because people just did not like it. You know, they didn't oh see gosh. it on the shelf the same way. And it was just a really interesting little documentary about the power of a package or the power of an image. But when you're starting something new, you can make mistakes and you can change. You have such a small, relatively speaking, you know, compared to like a Tropicana, because you just started, you know, today or whenever. Yeah. Uh, that you can make those changes and, and you can realize that your brand will change as you change. And my brand has changed, you know, a bunch of times, but I've evolved as a person and as a interviewer and a podcast person. So those things change. Yeah. So I think that's a cool, cool experience. I want to, before we get, we're, we're already 45 minutes into this, which is went by really fast. Jeez. Yeah, it did. <laughs> so I don't want to miss out on, on a couple of key things I really wanted to ask you about, which is one is Minneapolis is a coffee city. Minneapolis is a major city that is kind of tucked away. And I think people kind of forget about it because they look at the Midwest and they see Chicago and yeah. all the attention goes there. <laughs> but Minneapolis is a great town. I've spent a lot of time there, but I have struggled to find coffee when I'm there because it's spread out a little bit more, but I'm an outsider. So what's your reflection of Minneapolis as a coffee city? Yeah, I do think it is like, I think that's true. Like things are a little spread out and, you know, even our transit system, like we don't have like a tight network of, you know, we don't have like the L, we don't have a robust bus system and, to get things quickly. So, you know, you but really you have plow, to. Get, I think you plow bike lanes in the winter. So I believe so. Yes, we are still treating our cyclers with uh, the respect of their own lane during the winter. <laughs> So I think you have to be intentional about like, okay, where is the location of the city that I'm like focusing on today to explore? Because otherwise you're just gonna spend like a half hour going back and forth from one end to the other. Oftentimes we will we will tell folks that they should check out uh, Fragment Coffee, which is kind of in the downtown, north downtown area. And it's called the North Loop, which is kind of like up and coming with a lot of like big businesses and some breweries and of course, condo lofts, because uh, that's the natural progression of those those things. 
And they bring in coffee from, you know, across the globe, which is kind of unique experience to taste something outside of the city. So at like a cafe level, we have a lot of like good, good ca cafe spots. We also have like really good, like one-off where, you know, in South Minneapolis, we have folks like uh, Wesley Andrews, who is doing a lot of focus on like tea and coffee and did a lot of like importing of tea themselves and like uh, logistics for importing coffee from Yunnan for their own operations. And also I believe they might rent out a little time on their roaster. So kind of like helping foster a little bit of a roasting community there. We have a lot of folks that will just like roast a brand and then like have it offered at a shop. We have uh, Tony Quiro, who was, I believe, a national uh, roaster champion, was at Spy House Coffee, started his own brand and um, offers some like sweet, small, like micro lots that he, that he serves out, which is really cool. But we also have a booming Northwest and Northeast presence now. St. Cloud, Minnesota, which about an hour and a half west of Minneapolis, is doing its own like kind of like coffee festival. So they kind of like bring brands in and they kind of celebrate together. I forget the name of the company up there off the top of my head, but yeah, somebody up there is bringing in a crew and the North Shore has Fika Coffee, Almanac Coffee in Duluth, Minnesota. Yeah, brands are popping up all over the place, which is kind of cool. It's funny you asked that because I saw a article the other day that was like top 10 best cities to get coffee. And, you know, you scroll and it's always like a coastal city and then Chicago. And I was like, oh, what about Minneapolis? But then I saw that they were doing it like per capita of like cappuccinos mm. purchased or something like that. <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, OK, well, that's totally different. Yeah, that doesn't count. What I find interesting about those lists and just the idea of what makes for a great, you know, place to get coffee is a lot of them are just based on, I mean, if you are a major city, if you're in New York or Chicago and LA, uh, you know, I think Minneapolis is somewhere in the, the 12, 13, 14 range. Could be wrong on that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, like know, just, population. Just above. Yeah. Just above, but just below. You know, when you have a, a city of that size, you would think there's going to be enough quantity that there's going to be standouts. Yeah. And what I find is that the bigger the city, the more likely it is you can get great coffee, but it's not any less likely that you're going to get bad coffee either. Or, yeah. you know, places where the coffee just isn't the focus. And that's okay. There's room for that. Where I think it really matters more is in what you're describing as some of the more, the, the cities that surround the big city where they might only have two or three options to start or one, you know, the city yeah. I grew up in did not have any, you know, when I was growing up, you know, our, when we got our first Starbucks, which wasn't that long ago, it was a huge deal and that. still is a huge deal, but they also now have four or five local coffee roasters who have popped up because they can learn on their own online or through companies like yours, or the, the access to a one kilo roaster seems to be a lot greater than it was even a dozen years ago. So it's 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 a constantly growing and evolving thing. What did yeah. I miss today? What should what did you want to talk about that I didn't ask or that we didn't get to you off the list? I see you have a bunch of musical uh you got guitars and a and a uke behind you. Is that part of guitars, your guitars, you ukulele, we got cameras and game consoles and lava lamps over here. Plethora of items. <laughs> Original Nintendo? Oh yes. Yep. Yeah, I don't, Ryan. I feel like we could talk for talk forever. There's so much. Well, we can talk again. We'll just label this part one of many. That's a good. Yeah, that's a good way. Part one through uh, what is it? I don't know what the Roman numerals would be for for two and well, actually, that's easy. They're just like they look like eyes. But no, I I mean I think overall just that you know coffee should be fun, and for somebody that's you know, always talking to maybe a dozen different companies like on a weekly basis about like how things are going, helping them set up roasters. I think it's easy when you're in a bubble to kind of forget that like everything's going to be okay. And at the end of the day, it's just coffee. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think that's a, that's a great attitude, but I would also point out that, you know, we just spent the last hour almost talking about the last 15 plus years of your life 
and they all happen to revolve around this one amazing thing, which is coffee, it's right? Like, <laughs> it's 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 the buildup of these little unique experiences where you know it's going to all be okay at the end of the day, but that's what makes a life. Yeah, definitely. Could, couldn't have put it better. I'm grateful for our conversation for no other reason than it gave me this memory of of having those coffees when I was 17, 18. And, and I wasn't drinking the coffee. I think I was drinking hot chocolate because I didn't like coffee. But yeah. Remembering that sitting around experience, you know, that around the diner table. Yeah. Sharing of stories and ideas and talking foolishly about what we were going to do in life. <laughs> Averages bring people together. <laughs> That's right. Speaking of which, uh, the next time you're on the road traveling with the education team to make the world a better, brighter place, you stop into a random un unnamed coffee shop. What are you going to order for yourself? Ooh. The big the big thing going on has been, you know, like a a a one in one, uh, you know, espresso and, you know, maybe like a small cup of other milk beverage, which which I've never, you know, ordered myself, but I know that's popular. But what I will tend to do is usually a cortado or Gibraltar, depending on what they're calling it on by that shop. And just a cup of, you know, a single origin that looks like something I'd fancy, like a Peru, or if I recognize the importer, if they represent that, I might get the coffee based on the importer if I remember working with them at some point. That's usually my go-to. Can I assume that you go out of your way to just stop at the airport for coffee now? <laughs> oh my gosh, I try to, <laughs> ugh. I went there, I was at the airport not too long ago and that my location does not exist anymore. They got rid of it. It's full circle. Maybe that's yeah. your next step. <laughs> you start a full scale roasting operation at the airport. <laughs> I can't, I can't go back to the airport. It's too much, Ryan. <laughs> Brian, it's been just a real pleasure getting to know you a little bit better and, and learning more of your story. I do hope you come back and we get to chat again and, and get, you know, we've, we've gone beyond the, the opening salvo here. Like we can learn more. Yeah, I hope to I hope to be back in your neck of the woods as well. And yeah, if you're ever in town, make sure to stop by. Come see the Mill City facility. I would love to. Okay, some key takeaways from the show today. The Aromatic app is an AeroPress timer app for your phone with a bunch of AeroPress recipes. I just downloaded it on my phone, and I kind of love it. It takes some of the thinking out of my first coffee of the day, which is when it is hardest for me to do real thinking. So if you want to have a little fun with the AeroPress, check it out. And I will say they are not a sponsor of this show. It was 2010 that a crafted cup of coffee, an Ethiopian natural washed process from Dogwood, at a dying mall in South Minneapolis, was memorable enough for Bryant to keep coming back for more. He became one of us, humans who were previously living a blissfully craft coffee unaware life. He set a mission for himself to get a job in craft coffee. But it didn't happen right away. He had to work for it. It took stops at Big Coffee, at the airport, and even a coffee-adjacent restaurant before he got his chance to work for Dogwood Coffee directly as a production roaster. Bryant's initial craft coffee job, which I'm saying with air quotes, which I actually did here in the booth, was at the airport. I only hesitate on the title because sadly, his training, or lack thereof, isn't uncommon at hospitality jobs. There has long been a sink or swim mentality in the industry, but education and training is one of the things that separates the specialty side of coffee apart. Bryant spent the first few months of that job teaching himself how to brew excellent coffee and use an espresso machine using YouTube. It's no wonder he now finds himself in the coffee education space. After years as the primary production roaster at Dogwood Coffee, a little thing called coronavirus threw a wrench in his career but because sometimes things work out, he eventually got a call from Mill City Roasters, where he is now able to teach others how to have a better relationship with coffee and their coffee roasting equipment. He's helping to build their coffee knowledge base and improve their swimming skills, so to speak, before they get pushed into the deep end of the coffee pool. Being a coffee roaster himself for his own company, Relative Coffee, Bryant is better able to provide coffee education especially as it relates to the Mill City equipment he's working on. It's a win-win-win situation, as Jared from Hosea Coffee Source would say. 
Mill City benefits because they are better able to serve and by extension sell to their customers, who win because they are getting advice and coffee education from someone experiencing the same things they are. And Bryant wins because he gets to pursue a passion and develop his coffee roasting brand. I'll make a note that it just started to rain, and if you hear that in the background of this audio, eh, such is life. I'm drinking a coffee that's kind of gray and cloudy out. It's kind of lovely, actually. Finally, coffee brings creativity and science together. For him, relative coffee is an opportunity to flex both of those parts of his personality. Thanks to Brian for taking some time to chat with me, and to all of us. I'm hoping to get him back on some future episodes of Coffee Smarter. If you're not already following that show, search for it wherever you're listening to this show, and be sure to hit the follow button. It's a great way to learn how to brew better cups of coffee at home. Or you can head to coffeepeoplepodcast.com, where I'll recap this show and share more coffee everything. Seriously, it's a great resource for finding coffee information and coffee stories. That's coffeepeoplepodcast.com. And if you're close to my home here in Southern California, don't forget to stop by Zumbar Coffee and Tea, Steady State Coffee Roasting, Camp Coffee Company, and or Asento Coffee Roasters to guess how many coffee beans are in that jar I mentioned at the top. We're running holiday guessing game contests at all four. The winners will receive $50 gift cards or coffee beans and merch to those aforementioned cafes courtesy of, uh, well, this podcast, me. I think people should have coffee for the holidays. The contest runs through December 14th, so stop by, write down your name, write down your guess, make sure you write it clearly, and if you win, you'll be able to save your holiday money for that new coffee brewer. Thanks to all of the rest of our great industry partners, including Roastar Coffee Packaging, an excellent coffee packaging company that tells the big stories of small business coffee roasters. Learn more at Roastar.com. As well as Ignite Coffee Company, Maria Coffee, Cape Horn Coffee Importers, Moster Coffee Company, San Franciscan Roaster Company, Crossings Coffee, Civets Roasting Machines, First Light Coffee Whiskey, Hasea Coffee Source, Coffee Cycle Roasting, and Ascend Coffee Roasters. That's all for today. This show is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network, and this episode is, was, has been written, produced, and recorded by me, Ryan Wolt. Always tip your baristas and be sure to drink good coffee. Hello? Uh, are you still there? You know the show's over, right? I do too, but I kind of like using this space to share more about what I'm drinking and listening to and just random thoughts. I spent the past week brewing up the Morning Dove coffee blend from Lofty Coffee. It took me a week to finally get a couple of cups of coffee that I thought really brought out the flavors I was looking for. I tried brewing on a Kalita Wave, an automatic brewer, a V60, and a French press. Hopefully I can save you some time. If you end up picking up a bag from Lofty, I got the best results using a French press at a 16 to 1 ratio. And letting it brew for an extended amount of time, for me that was about 5 minutes 15 seconds, which frankly only happened by accident. I was actually glad for the extra time, because I was listening to the new album from Gracie Horse, one word with a capital G and a capital H on Spotify, called LA Shit. It's folk rock, rock, country, and storytelling, and I'm digging it. I'll link to my coffee listening podcast on Spotify on RoastWestCoast.com. Check it out.